In part one, we discovered what tragically emerged decades ago from Cardinal Dearden's Call to Action Conference. With the aim of reversing what was set in motion back then, this Call to Action Convention is being held at the very same place to set straight the path, as John the Baptist put it, this one nation under God that was divinely raised up to be a beacon of light to the world. We have let our church and our nation fall away from Catholic truth, and it is now beyond urgent that we return wholeheartedly to the Lord and leave the fatal notions of relativistic modernism, born of communist Marxist progressive leftist ideologies, behind. Welcome to CandlelightPress.org, where the light of truth dispels darkness. I'm Mary McMenamin. In this hall, we socialized, dined, and whined about the evils this nation has embraced, made manifest in our leaders and legislation, our schools and communities, even within Christ's holy Catholic Church. In the room before me, armed with an impressive arsenal of knowledge and experience, inspiring panelists provided insider insights and expertise as they laid out the plan of action for Christ's faithful warriors and their call to action. We learned that the aim of Church Militant's first ever Action Calling Convention is to confront head-on the malignant errors that have undermined not only our country, but human freedom at large on account of shameful inaction. And here we are at the imminent front, the prophesied battle of good against evil and the lukewarm indifference the Lord says he will spew out of his mouth, Revelation 3.16. In this fifth episode, we will uncover such questions as, are we witnessing an era of Pharaoh-like, Judas-like hardening of heart worldwide? Other than this convention being held where Cardinal Dearden's once was, what other prophetic signs might we have missed that are being sent worldwide to call the faithful to action, while at the same time perhaps terrifying the unprepared and irreligious? Finally, what are the faithful not doing enough, and what can they easily do right now to seek reparation and increase holiness? These questions and more will be answered, giving even our clerics and theologians alike some useful takeaways. So let's open with this era's heralding voice, not John the Baptist who leapt in Elizabeth's womb upon encountering the just-conceived Lord of heaven and earth, but the Ark of Christ's new covenant in the flesh, the new woman most perfectly made among women from whom he draws his very blood and DNA, his undefiled Mother Mary, who now comes to us to make straight the path for her son, God's son's return. Scripture repeatedly foretells of our time as our Blessed Mother, to whom her son entrusted from the cross all beloved disciples, continues to call her children, the brothers and sisters of Christ, to contend for conversion and fight the good fight in the name of her son, God's son. She comes to us as did John the Baptist to herald Christ's coming because countless numbers are running toward infernal destruction as the waltzing off to a party. The poorly formed spiritually have strayed because they do not understand that there is only one truth, one path, and one gate through the organized Yes, organized religion that Christ instituted. Quote, For whoever does not enter the sheepfold through the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a marauder, John 10.1. Tragically, within and without the church, so many, bishops included, have strayed from millenniums held Catholic teaching or left entirely Christ's organized religion to embrace a disorganized one in the name of modernization, the false church that has emerged from within, rife with sin-tolerant, errant, man-made ideologies that merely prepares the lost sheep for Antichrist's final deception. Paul warned, quote, Let no one deceive you. The apostasy comes first, and the lawless one is revealed, the one doomed to perdition, 
who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god and object of worship, so as to seat himself in the temple of God, claiming that he is a god, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and in every wicked deceit for those who are perishing, because they have not accepted the love of truth, so that they may be saved. Therefore, God is sending them a deceiving power, so that they may believe the lie that all who have not believed the truth but have approved wrongdoing may be what? Condemned. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4, 7, and 9 to 12. So much for presuming upon grace with the hope of repenting at the last minute, the ultimate playing with fire. God is not mocked, and he sees through such rationalizations. The Lord knows which sheep and shepherds belong to him, unlike the hiring who sees a threat and, quote, leaves the sheep and runs away and the wolf catches and scatters them, John 10, 12, a catching and scattering that has been occurring for centuries now. Yes, beloved ones, we are witnessing this prophesied hardening of hearts as was seen back in Pharaoh's day and the Pharisees' day, but at an unprecedented level. The solution, therefore, must be activated within truth-loving hearts that serve the Lord through the one holy Catholic and apostolic church he instituted, now being tested by Satan, as was Jesus in the desert, to the precipice of peril. The time is now, the stakes decisive, silence today is tomorrow's crisis. Whoever is wise will take note of these things, Psalm 107, closes as it opens a prayer for victory, Psalm 108, followed by the prayer of a person falsely accused. How familiar are the tactics described in Psalm 109 of the wicked against the innocent who cry out to God day and night? How tragically many have let themselves be fooled into thinking that God, if they acknowledge his omniscience at all, either approves or does not see what damage they inflict upon others. Woe to the Sinos, Catholics in name only, and Rhinos, Republicans in name only, and all hypocrites who muddy the water of truth with their dirty hoofs, while the wise continue to take note of these things, ponder God's mercy, and contend for the salvation of souls despite the left's silencing intimidation, cancellation, persecution, and slander from the sin-devoted and intentionally uninformed, the cowards, the bought-and-paid-for hirelings, and, most seditiously of all, the lukewarm Catholics. Know, too, that from consecrated souls and those blessed with understanding, lay and religious alike, more is expected. We are witnessing the final fall for Christ's sully bride, who, as prophesied, must take up her cross and follow her Lord on this Via Della Rosa through temptation, betrayal, denial, scourging, and torture on way to her ultimate victory. The divine justice of mercy hopefully topples those in authority that they may see their error and repent. If they refuse to learn from either love or chastisement, they will ultimately be given over to their mortal desires at the cost of their very souls. Just as our Lord's merciful act of exposing his betrayer Judas Iscariot, who neither repented nor was deterred, quote, none of them is lost among the twelve, but the son of perdition, Judas, let us nevertheless challenge this Pharaoh-like, Judas-like hardening of heart hypothesis and see what our courageous reporters of all things Catholic have to say about it. Is this the prophesied climatic hardening that even worldwide exposure through modern media cannot deter? A sort of warning prejudgment, if you will, upon the weeds and wolves among us? I put forth the question first to Church Militant's producer-reporter Hunter Bradford, quote, have you personally seen any evidence of the public uncovering of sin, reparative for a healthy soul, inspire repentance, apology, even reparation in offenders you have reported on? In other words, could it be that their hearts are so hardened that exposure or humiliation 
merely entrenches them more deeply in untruth? Now, more than ever, wouldn't you say it's a problem? Okay. When they get a taste of their medicine and they get exposed, have you ever seen an example where they repented? Me, in my life, no. Yeah. Uh, people probably more steadfastly commit to yeah. the mortal sin, the, the scandal that they were already committing. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the people of goodwill, uh, they will respond, of course, well to getting called out, even mm -hmm. like charitably called out. Mm -hmm. But someone, someone who's not of goodwill, they've already hardened their hearts so much or to, mm -hmm. the, to such a degree that a, you know, a very fiery message to them is not mm -hmm. going to do anything. So today, when you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the rebellion, warns the Lord, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test. I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. So take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away, be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if only, that is, only if, we hold our first confidence firm to the end. St. John the Baptist right. in scriptures, those people that he blasted against, or even the, the Pharisees that, yeah, they yeah. didn't repent. They right. just, they got worse and worse and worse. So unfortunately, like the people in scripture, now I've not seen anyone. So why does God allow the sons of rebellion to prosper for a time? Why does he allow them to continue hardening in their error to the point of their own destruction? Because God's plan cannot be thwarted by his enemies. Rather, they will ultimately see for themselves the futility of their efforts when, in the end, their selfish labors will have only served God's purposes for the good of his heirs, those who remained united to him through thick and thin. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then God has mercy upon whomever he wills, and he hardens the heart of whomever he wills. What will it be for you? Obedience that comes from faith that leads to life? Or the rebelliousness that leads to eternal death? Choose life. Do you feel like they actually go into it with that intent? Who? The bishops, they went to some kind of special Masonic training or something. <laughs> or do you think that they got intimidated or molded into what they ended up doing? What, what is just like your personal thoughts? Where did that originate in them? Well, I think there are different groups of bishops. Mm -hmm. So there's one group like the Supiches that mm -hmm. Uh, are like very likely communists mm -hmm. and entered seminary um, with an agenda. Yes, like an yes. infiltration right. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but then there's the other other group that they may not be communists, but they don't believe church teaching mm -hmm. and think that church teaching should change. So when it comes to the the Supich group, mm -hmm. I think they intentionally entered seminary. Uh, with the intention of changing uh, not just the church teaching like the other group, mm -hmm. but the very structure with bringing the church down. That was the goal. Yeah. But the, you know, Kind of the fulfillment who, of the Fatima warning, you know, the errors of Russia yes. spreading it over, Russia. kind of this crew yes. of info, these minions that come in mm -hmm. and just, yeah. hey, if you get the church, you get the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, I think... Have you read the book uh, by Julia Maloney, St. Gallen Mafia? Those five Mafia members, um, I don't know if they entered seminary, um, you know, with the world view of, of, that they have now, but somewhere along the lines, they definitely obviously adopted it and have been on a tear uh, attempting to, to change the church church teaching on uh, giving the Eucharist to divorce and remarried Catholics yeah. and women priests and all that kind of stuff. I don't know where that happens along the line, to mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing the kind of 
people that were in seminaries and running seminaries in the 50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. um, someone like Cardinal John Dearden, who ran Detroit decades ago, um, I think they're probably, they go in vulnerable, they go in moldable men, mm -hmm. and if you put those moldable, vulnerable young men around older, firmly evil men, mm -hmm. men who are are grounded with in, authority over with, them. Yes, yeah. with uh, really a communist worldview, mm -hmm. it's very easy to become uh, what you surround yourself mm -hmm. with. I mean, think of most teenagers who go off to college, mm -hmm. or like with their family when they were in high school and growing up, they went to Sunday mass, maybe they pray mm -hmm. the rosary, mm -hmm. they very easily abandon it. Mm -hmm. Now, switch, use that same model to a young 18-year-old kid, mm -hmm. young boy who knows he should be looking up to these old men, and mm -hmm. really does, mm -hmm. because that's the whole point, and, uh, you know, he's telling them that the way they think about the church and everything is wrong, it's very easy for them to uh, take on the worldview of his superiors. So I think that would yeah. that would serve to explain some of the examples, but there's so many different groups of, of bishops um, that yeah. I, it's hard to use one story or one answer to explain all of them. Now on a personal level, have you ever thought of yourself in terms of the opposite? You are the positive, you're the young guy coming in Kind of, under, I guess you'd call the tutelage of Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, he's yeah. talking about the legacy of yes. church militant, yeah. and there you guys are, yeah. and you're being formed yes. in the true church teaching, and you're out yeah. there to counter that. No, yeah, I mean, that's like history in the making. You, this is an amazing yeah. time we're living in. That, that must, does that ever like wake you up at night and go, whoa? I'm a part of this. This is like the book of Revelation. Honestly, Here I, am. I would say the when I have those sort of moments, it's it's when I'm talking to I call them normal people when I'm <laughs> outside people. of church militant when yeah. I'm uh, when we're at an event and I'm talking to people who listen to us. I have that experience of like, wow, I have the ability to form people's minds, and that's yeah. what I do on the evening news every single night. Uh -huh. And they'll tell me like, yeah, you know what, we, you're in our our living room like every single night yeah. and like that is such a uh you don't see it you're just looking at a camera yeah and here people are yeah. all over like we feel like we all know yeah. you personally and you're like who are you it but, really is a yeah. huge blessing it's also yeah. responsibility um but i i feel that weight of um of justice to, to tell the truth mm -hmm. to uh form souls and intellects um every single night and i do feel the sense of, uh, I guess, like a foot soldier in a big battle. Um, yeah, I, kn I know I have a role in this this war of good and evil, and um, my role is at Church Militant, and I like playing the role. I'm enjoying it. Um, and you do it so well. Hopefully, yeah. my, my sword is, is red with uh, the blood of the enemy, and it yep. keeps getting more red. No doubt it is. Yeah. Well, thank you so yeah, much no, thank for you. that. <laughs> well, God bless you. This has been such a great I put the same question to producer and resistance overseer and MC Joe Gallagher, regarding any indication of conversion within church ranks upon being exposed, called out, reprimanded, refuted, or corrected for making a pretense of Christ's religion by conspiring with evil and gain, power, or pleasure over God. Average Catholic, okay. a lot of times scatters when the lights turn on and they're, they say they're going to get exposed or whatever. And But when we see the bishops get exposed... Instead of scatter, they tend to be more ingrained in what they're doing, almost hardened, and pursue it further, and it doesn't seem to scare them off. And I was wondering if you have ever seen examples of repentance and conversion on account of exposure amongst the, the clergy. Have you ever witnessed such a thing, or do people just keep becoming more hardened? With reference to the Episcopacy? Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, outside of, you have Cardinal Viganò, but, or, uh, I'm sorry, Arch Archbishop Viganò, but that wasn't really out of exposure. Correct. It was yeah. more out of his, whatever it was, God's grace. Yeah. But the idea of exposure, 
ideally is, of course, to get those types of people to of not, course. yeah, to to repent. Mm -hmm. But what is the actual more attainable result? Yeah. For them to walk away and to yeah. leave their position of power, and somebody else in the future to come in that is a little bit better. Do you think because they're such targets of Satan, because they are able to consecrate what angels can't even do? that maybe they're hit so hard by him that kind of once you fall into that, it's like almost impossible to get out. It's like uh, much harder than it would be, say, for an average person having a reversion. Well, I think, yeah, obviously you're going to fall harder. And, um, when you are a leader in the church, your hands are consecrated, and mm -hmm. that's different. There's a transformation that happens after ordination. Mm -hmm. And so the soul is truly different. You are a priest forever. Mm -hmm. You're not married forever, mm -hmm. but you are a priest forever. forever. And, and it, that is a big deal. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So you would think that if they know about hell, that the fear of hell, knowing how bad it would be for consecrated souls, they must, in your view, do they just not believe in hell? Or are they purposely doing this as if they want to go there? They've been deceived into thinking they want to go there? If you ask any any person that has had a, a leave from the faith, mm -hmm. and you ask them when they were doing the bad things that they whatever they were doing, whether you know they go into the hookup culture, or they live a gay lifestyle, or they just don't practice faith anymore, or they fall into drugs, whatever it may be, the moment you leave a state of grace and you ask a person, why why did you do that? Mm -hmm. the, what's one of the biggest answers that you're going to get? Well, I just stopped thinking about it. God stops slowly, and this is Saint Paul writes about this over time. He's going to stop offering opportunities to cooperate with grace because it's an act of mercy, knowing that as you fall deeper and deeper and deeper into sin, and also just on a physical, behavioral level, like just regular human virtues, mm -hmm. if as you continue to crumble and crumble and crumble, you're going to eventually find a moment where our Lord is going out of mercy to stop offering opportunities for grace because mm -hmm. He knows you're going to reject it more, therefore intensifying your damage. Oh, yeah. St. Yeah. Paul writes, it's scriptural. it's scriptural. Hand them over to their own desires and, and let the fallout. Of, what was that, the one he says about hand them over to Satan, that his body be destroyed for the sake of his soul? It's terrifying. Yeah. It's, it's terrifying. It's, so, it's, yeah. But at the end of the day, you need prayers. But do they believe in it? I would say at first he just started learning it to love himself. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's the foundation we were mentioning earlier when it came to, came to the Christians situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, the Catholics, and, you know, they're, they usually scatter, or they're too afraid, they don't really want to be involved. That's because it's a, it's a love of self. Mm -hmm. It's an absence of virtue. Specifically for men, mm -hmm. it is effeminate. A man who is effeminate lacks virtue. That's it. Yeah. Father Ripperger says that. Mm -hmm. So, for... Catholics to truly be able to stand up and face persecution and do what is right and defend it. They have to master virtue because that is a mastering over uh, over yourself. Yeah. And it's a love of the higher. Because of course, you know, I'm the wax on the other one. Yeah, that's it. Well, and it says that there's no cowards in, in heaven. Oh, the cowardly, thing. effeminate men, yeah. no nope, out, boy prostitutes, you know, it goes on that big list. And here we have so many Christians deceived into thinking that, you know, you can just be saved and you're good to go and you're in and, and do, you know, do what you uh, want. Do you want to know who else, uh, what other type of person is in heaven? The only type of person in heaven? What? A Catholic. Yeah. It's the only person who's in heaven. That, you know, they go through the Catholic Church to get there whether they know it or not. Yeah, extra ecclesia nulla salus. Yeah. You don't have to die Catholic right. to make it to heaven, but when you get, get in, in, you're, you're Catholic. Catholic. <laughs> That's a good note to close on. Thank you so much. Reporting daily on the mutiny occurring among clerical ranks, Catholic reporters like Joe and Hunter clearly recognize the gravity of the crisis. This hardening, fatal state of I just stop thinking about it, as the Lord insists we do. To enter the difficult way to the narrow gate is not to self-identify as a member of Christ's body, his church on earth, but for the Lord to identify you among the ranks of those who truly follow him. The ones cast out into the darkness, despite crying, Lord, Lord, and hearing what he says, are those who refuse to do what he says. Thus, his condemnation, quote, 
I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Woe to those who indulge in the fruit of faith without works and works without faith to be ultimately spewed out of Christ's mouth with the lukewarm Christians of Revelation 3.16 and those who persist in refusing to do what the Lord commands. Their twisted version of it. Hell's infiltrators hide like snakes among church and state ranks, waiting for the opportune time to strike, or, in St. Paul's words, quote, there will be terrifying times in the last days. People will be self-centered and lovers of money, proud, haughty, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, irreligious, callous, implacable, slanderous, licentious, brutal, hating what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than God, as they make a pretense of religion, pretending Catholicism, but deny its power. Reject them, for some of these slip into homes and make captives of those weighed down by sins, led by various desires, always trying to learn but never able to reach a knowledge of truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres oppose Moses, so they also oppose the truth people of depraved mind, unqualified in the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be plain to all. Yes, in fact, all who want to live religiously in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and charlatans will go from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived. But you remain faithful to what you have learned and believed because you know from whom you learned it, uh, the one apostolic church. All scripture is inspired by God, yes, even the books Protestants removed, and is useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness, not rationalization, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Yes, works do matter, be them what you do or what you don't do that you should. Paul then tells us what to do. Quote, Proclaim the word. Be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Convince. Reprimand. Encourage through all patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not get this. Tolerate sound doctrine. Hmm, sound familiar? But following their own desires and insatiable curiosity will accumulate teachers and stop listening to the truth and will be diverted to myths, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Uh, such myths as one's biological sex or a tiny human's life being merely a choice, a decision, just as they'll convince you that the church is behind the times, that Christ our Lord approves of communion for divorced and remarried, that the abolition of priestly celibacy on way to the ordination of women to the priesthood is a good thing in the service of unifying the church with Protestantism, page 153 of the St. Gallen Mafia, instead of bringing Protestants to the fullness of truth in the universal faith Christ established for the sake of humanity's salvation. When the prophesied shofar, the trumpet is blasted from heaven, They'll convince you, oh, this it's a, a hoax. hoax. These sounds are a copy of the alleged Bigfoot recordings made in the early 1970s. They're recordings of strange sounds that defy explanation. And this one will leave your head ringing. Dylan Dickerson is taking out the trash from his home in Lewisburg, North Carolina, when a loud noise startles him. Never heard anything like it. So loud. What is going on? Strange sounds are being heard around the world.
слышит этот звук. Блядь, пиздец полный. Это... Интересно, что это может быть, блядь? Пиздец полный. In Sweden, in Michigan, another trumpet-like sound. And when the illumination from heaven occurs, they'll tell you, oh, a flare from the sun caused it. Well, a partial truth, as the Son of God is the light of the world, our solar system is His, and a flare from Him might be a fitting description of what some experience in seeing their sins as God does. Therefore, quote, to be doing the works of God, John 6, 28, that Paul says God will equip His own for, requires not mere belief about Him, but belief in Him, in the truth that He is which is an inness that inspires proper action. The in is crucial because one can serve only one master in this all-or-nothing way. Finally, we have our spiritual warfare panel's pro-life warrior exorcist priest, Father Stephen Imbarato, who has been repeatedly persecuted and jailed for heinous crimes like handing out roses and encouragements and prayers to women and girls at abortuaries that perhaps one tiny human, and the mother blessed with the honor of loving that awaiting-to-be-born child into life, might be spared. What does Father Stephen Imbarato have to say about this spiritual battle? A lot. First of all, know that prayer is not part of our relationship with our Lord. It is our relationship. We communicate with the one we love, sharing plans, triumphs, and failings, and we trust in that one to assist us. But love is a two-way street. Those in true love trust, communicate, share, respect, appreciate, and, and listen. listen. And I believe that our Lord will speak to me in my thoughts, that my thoughts are coming from our Lord. Now, of course, if the thoughts come into your head, you can't just automatically assume you can't automatically assume that it's our Lord talking. That's, That's why the discernment continues. Yes. It always continues. It's nonstop. But it's a matter of opening yourself up and mm -hmm. say, all right, Lord, I'm listening. Talk to me, right? That's scriptural. And our Lord will start talking to you. And the Blessed mm -hmm. Mother will start talking to you. Many times when I prayed the rosary, our Lord, uh, the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the reason why I'm in Florida is because a year ago, June, praying the rosary, 
All right, our Lord told me I want you to move from New Mexico to Florida. <laughs> Two months later, I was in Florida, and uh, and now uh, my he ministry is operating out of Florida. Yep, yep. Yeah. There it is. And well, it was it's a, it's interesting because you yeah. were talking about like the demonic element. Like, look at what Padre Pio went through. Yeah. He actually came as his uh, spiritual advisor yeah. in bodily right, right. form. That's right. That was a good point you make. That as you develop and as you mature in Christ, the the tricks of the devil can actually be more. It can be more advanced. Say. Well, absolutely. And, and well, like, if you experience like a competition of the voices, like you're quiet, you're listening for the Lord, and unlike, course, the Eastern religions where you empty your your mind, that's we we empty ourselves of ourselves, say, but not our intellect and our mind. We engage. Yeah, our, our Lord but, revealed this when I was in the seminary. I remember uh, brother seminarian uh, called me up at three o'clock in the afternoon. He wanted me to come down and tutor him. And I was exhausted. I'd been up yeah. since five in the morning, uh -huh. and and I I was exhausted. And and I, I I I told him I said, look at Anthony, I'll come down and help you after dinner tonight. He says, well, I was hoping you'd come down now. I'm going out to dinner tonight. Oh. I'm going out after dinner, right? Yeah. And so I actually put my hand over the phone and looked up and said, Lord, I do not want to do this. Now I don't hear our Lord's voice. I get <laughs> thoughts in my head, yeah. and I. Clear Clearly, our Lord clearly put in my head, that's why you need to do it. Oh, right? Because you don't want that's to That's right. Do it. So now, when I don't want to do something, I hear our Lord say, yeah. that's why you need to do it. Well, the Bishop right? Sheen said, suffering is God's bull That's right. Not that's the right. still quiet voice. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. 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 So look at, thank you for giving me this thank opportunity so again. Thank you uh, protestchildkilling.com protestchildkilling.com I'm an accessible priest get in touch with me and as I tell everybody after the blessing the almighty God bless you Father, Son, Holy Spirit Amen go out into the world today and give them heaven Amen The Blessed Father gives us the seed do as he tells you do as he tells you so you know we criticize St. Peter eh, maybe not verbally criticized but you know, Peter gets a lot of flack for when he's walking on the water, he kind of like realizes, wait a minute, I'm walking on the water in this big storm, right? He loses his faith, and he starts to sing, and he cries out, Lord, save me, and our Lord, save me. We never think about the fact that he's the only one who got out of the boat. Mm -hmm. right? He got out of the boat. We don't criticize the other 11 who are in the boat, right? So we need to get out of the boat. We need to get out of the boat. The Blessed Mother will help us get out of the boat. The Blessed Mother, since the Ascension, has been the greatest prophet in the church. Right? The history of the church by far. I mean, there's nobody close. So the Blessed Mother will always point us to Jesus. She tells us to do as he tells you, but it's important that we understand that in a spiritual life, we can do the will of God without doing the will of God for us. God has a will for each and every one of us. Our Christian brothers and sisters are not down and say, well, God has a plan for you. Well, that's absolutely right. right. But we can just do the will of God, check off the list, right, and live our faith in a comfort zone. But God does not want us there. He wants to do us for do his will. So we need to ask our Lord every single day, Lord, what more do you want me to do? My, my journey, and I was a heathen for 15 years back when I was guilty of an abortion course of life. I found out decades later of two babies, two babies, so a wounded Eve and two babies. And uh, that's when my journey started. All right, and thank God through the mercy of our Lord, in spite of that great sin, greatest sin in my life, He's allowed me to become a priest, pro-life activist priest, and through my sin, be able to actually not only save many babies by the grace of God, but bring a lot of women and men to healing by the grace of God. Through my sin, of course, that's what makes God most omnipotent, right? Not that He can create something from nothing, but He can take our evil less than nothing. St. Augustine said this, and turn it into good, turn it into grace, right? My journey started with that great sin, and I am, as many of you 
know, and I haven't been arrested in two years, but I'm part of the Red Rose Rescue Movement. And by the way, we have three Red Rose Rescuers in jail as we speak in Valhalla, New York. A fellow priest, Father Fidelis, uh, and Will Goodman and Matt Connolly, please keep them in your prayers. Uh, because again, as my two brothers here have created much sacrifice, or have, are during much sacrifice, so they are willing to give up their freedom and sacrifice by saving babies, right? Uh, and I, I think they're a model for us in terms of what more can we do? So I went from that place where I committed this great sin to be willing to go into abortion facilities, risking my freedom. I've spent time in jail. I've been arrested five times. Uh, probably be arrested at some point in the future uh, again. Uh, maybe even in Ireland. I'm looking to go over to Ireland and upset the apple cart over there with that buffer zone they want to create. Uh, so please pray about that because I'm trying to discern all that stuff. But it was by asking our Lord, starting in the, in the late 90s, before I went to the seminary, asking our Lord, Lord, what more can I do today to unite myself to you on the cross? What more can I do to lay down my life as you lay down your life for me? And you ask that every single day, and then you listen, you ponder, you ponder, you listen. I think one of the things that we don't do in this day and age is ponder, listen. Right? We pray, we pray, we pray, we pray, we do all the talk, we don't do any listening. Right? But listen, and you may not see anything dramatic happen day in and day out, day in and day out. But I guarantee you, you ask that simple thing of our Lord every day, you'll look back after three months, six months, one year, and you say, Whoa, man, I am not the person now that I was a year ago. Exactly right. That's a call to action right there. All right, so uh, call that. Keep close to the Blessed Mother. She'll point you to Jesus. Spend time in the Adoration Chapel. And when you're in the Adoration Chapel, listen. Listen. All right, maybe spend 10, 15 minutes praying the rosary, uh, uh, talking to our Lord, but then shut up and listen and ask our Lord, Lord, what more do you want me to do? And then also, we haven't talked about this, all right? The goal of every Catholic should be at some point in their lives, for the rest of their lives, their daily communicants, daily mass comes, right? I think that is key, all right? Mass is the source and sum of our lives. If it is, then every decision we make in our lives should be centered around, does it help me or hinder me in terms of being a daily communicant, a daily mass comes? Right? So um, these are the spiritual exercises that I think are, are so, so important. And again, Jesus said those who hear the word of God and act on it are wise. Those who hear the word of God and don't act on it are fools. So we need to listen to the word of God in prayer and then we need to act on it. Because, hey, the day's going to come when they're going to come into the synagogue and they're going to drag Save the worshiping God. you see across the water from Michigan. Going to go inside here. There's the Grand Ballroom and the convention. There's over 300 people. There goes Joe and a guy named Ian. And Ian's an interesting guy. You know when you hear people say, oh my gosh, or oh my gosh. 
Every time someone says that, he does the sign of the cross and it's a prayer because the word gosh or goodness is a replacement for the name of the Lord. And so he says a prayer and it's called it, it's the golden arrow prayer. Ian, I'm talking about you and your oh. prayers oh. and how you you taught us all a bunch of stuff. Oh. And I'm, I'm videotaping you. Lots of so say, say hi to everybody. Well, hello, everybody. It's <laughs> and, a pleasure for me to say hi to all of you. I don't know who you are. Yeah. God love you. Ian is a great guy. It's called, it's the Golden Arrow Prayer. Is that the yeah. one you say? Yes, that's the Golden Arrow. Yeah, because I was hearing, oh my God, all over the place. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Well, were, you good, do, yeah. were you having to do that? I'm, I was, but you know what? Not as much today. Blessed be God. But yes. Yes. In general, I've been hearing it all over the place, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, things happen. But. See, Ian's keeping us in line, and he's teaching us that exceptional level of holiness. Me too. I should not be the yeah. Brahman of holiness. <laughs> yeah. Talk to Michael Boris about being the Brahman of holiness. Yes. That guy. W-W-I-D, what would Ian do? <laughs> no. Right. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Ian. Michael right. Voris with Simon Rafe ran off with... Let oh, and here's Father you. Kalchik. Hi, Father. Hello. That was a great mass. So hard to... Um, put together in a hotel yes but we made it work you did so, and the, it was the, reverent and beautiful the, despite the candles being <laughs> battery operated you have to have your beeswax exactly. <laughs> ian is an amazing young man every time he hears someone say oh my anything be it goodness gosh or any vain replacement for the lord's name he signs himself with the cross and says the golden arrow prayer and he says it a lot. The golden arrow prayer was given by Jesus to Sister Mary of St. Peter, a Carmelite nun in France, in August of 1843. Sister Mary called it an act of praise that our Lord himself dictated for the reparation of blasphemy against God's holy name. How often we use the Lord's most holy name in vain, even those among what we consider polite society, each time we say, Oh my, including the acronym OMG. The word that oh my refers to, commonly beginning with a G, is merely a placeholder for the most holy name being used like an exclamation point to merely imply emphasis. Some say, well, what's wrong with referring to goodness? But is not God goodness itself? It should therefore not be used in this irreverent manner. So how much our Lord has suffered abuse in this regard. Our slings and arrows, as Shakespeare described it, our Lord showed Sister Mary how much blasphemy hurt him, more grievously than all other sins, like a poisoned arrow continually wounding his divine heart. Yet the golden arrow prayer, often recited as part of a group of prayers known as the Holy Face Devotion, sends a pleasing projectile to our Lord's heart piercing him delightfully like a salve upon wounds inflicted by sinner's malice and the torrents of graces emanating from it. It helps bring us closer to Christ by aiming to make amends for the countless insults he suffers daily, often the harshest, most offensive language about our Savior in the media and online. Consider how many people in these deranged days only say Jesus' name when they stub their toe or break a dish. We close with the prayer that you may memorize and use it. And believe me, you'll find plenty of opportunities. May the most holy, most sacred, most adorable, most incomprehensible and unutterable name of God be always praised, blessed, loved, adored, and glorified in heaven, on earth, and under the earth by all the creatures of God and by the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen. In this episode, we discovered that, yes, we are witnessing the prophesied worldwide era of Pharaoh, or, more fittingly, Judas-like hardening of heart. In addition to this convention being held where Dearden's was held decades before, we investigated other prophetic signs occurring worldwide that are a call to action for the vigilant faithful and an ominous warning to the wicked, the lukewarm, the unprepared, and the irreligious. Third, we found that in addition to praying without ceasing, as St. Paul put it, the faithful today need ears that can hear, as Jesus put it, 
ears that are attentive to God and listen, as Father Stephen put it, because our relationship with the Lord is a two-way street. Finally, we learned one simple work we can do right now to encounter what so offends our blessed Lord, pierce His sacred heart with the golden arrow prayer every time we hear His name used in vain. Memorize it and wield it often like a weapon to call down blessings like a healing sap over wounds inflicted through blasphemy. In the next episode, we will tour the Church Militant Studio and hear an amazing story, so stay tuned. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you in every way. Okay, well, I'm going to sign off and uh, say goodbye, everybody. Bye! Bye. Bye.